Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be breaking down Psych 101 because I know that exam season's coming up and you may have some questions and I'm going to try and break down the entire course, at least what is presented at the University of Waterloo in Ontario in their Psych 101 class. Like I said, I'm going to be doing the bare minimum. So this video is going to be pretty fast paced. If you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section below as I will be going through them pretty regularly and try to answer them as best as I possibly can. Again, if you do like this video, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe to my channel. It would really help me and it also helps you because there'll be more videos like this in the future. All right, so let's get started. Right, so an introduction to psychology. We're first looking at the historical perspectives and research methods used in psychology. As you should know, William James is known as the father of psychology. He was the first to define psychology as the science of mental life and focused on how the mind works and more generally what the mind is. Next we see some basic definitions of dualism, materialism, empiricism, and nativism. Dualism was used up to the early 1600s, and dualists believe that the body consists of a material body and an immaterial soul. This belief was very strongly held by the church and probably why it lasted for so long. And materialism kind of came about in the early 1600s when dualism was kind of fading away. And materialists believe that nothing else exists other than matter and energy. So there's no soul to materialists. Then we see empiricism in the 1700s, which basically stated that the mind is a blank slate and experience is what writes the words. So essentially tabula rosa. And we also see nativism at this time in the 1700s, which contrary to empiricism believes that we are born with some innate mechanisms and these are what help us go about life. Now, research types. You can have exploratory research, which explores a phenomenon with no predefined theories. Think observation. We have empirical research, which is testing theories for cause and effect relationships. Here we see researchers developing a hypothesis, which is essentially just a testable prediction about processes that can be observed and measured. There are two types of hypothesis that you should know. One is a research hypothesis, which is directly derived from initial research, and a null hypothesis, which is when the hypothesis derived from research is either opposite to the initial hypothesis or that there's no correlation at all. Next, we see correlational design. Correlational designs allow you to determine relationships between different variables, but you are not manipulating anything within that experiment. When you are manipulating something, then you are using an experimental design, which falls under the empirical studies. This allows you to determine causation, which correlation does not. And we see two different types of experimental studies. You can have a within subjects design, which is essentially that the same group does multiple experiments over multiple times. Or you can have a between subjects, which is different groups doing different experiments at the same time. So now we're going to be looking at biological psychology and essentially the nervous system. To begin, we have the central nervous system and we have the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is divided between the brain and the spinal cord. That is it. The brain can be subdivided into the hind brain, which is the back portion. The hind brain takes care of things that keeps us alive. So think heart rate, breathing rate. Then we have the midbrain, which processes things such as motivation, emotion, relay of sensory information, and regulates whether or not we are awake or we are asleep, which is essentially known as arousal within psychology. We then have the forebrain, which is where we see the different lobes of the brain. It is so important that you know these and you know the functions. We have the frontal lobe, organizes and plans events. Temporal lobe, sound processing, creating speech. Occipital lobe, vision and depth perception. And finally, we have the parietal lobe, which is responsible for pain, touch and the sensation of temperature. And then we have the peripheral system, which is the nerves throughout the rest of the body. So essentially everything other than the brain and the spinal cord. 
Now there are some names that you need to be familiar with when it comes to neuroscience methodologies and specifically looking at classic lesion studies. You need to know who Broca is. He studied people with brain injuries who had lost the ability to speak but still maintained the ability to understand language. This essentially was the first proof of localization of function and led to something called Broca's aphasia and Broca's area in the brain. Broca's aphasia is when somebody is able to understand speech but is not able to produce it. Second name you need to know is Wernicke and he is similar to Broca in that he studied patients with brain damage but in this case these patients couldn't understand speech or at least couldn't produce understandable speech but can speak fluently. So this one's a little bit trickier to understand, but essentially they are not producing sentences that are understandable to others, and there's no indication that they are understanding the words being spoken back to them. This again led to a Wernicke's area in the brain where that damage is, and Wernicke's aphasia, which essentially is when patients are able to produce speech, but it is not comprehensible. You should really know who Phineas Gage is. And now this one is not a psychologist or a researcher. Phineas Gage is instead the patient. He was in a construction accident where a piece of tubing or a bar or something went straight through his eye into his brain. It is so crazy that he survived, so that is amazing. On the surface, it didn't appear that Phineas did have brain damage. However, his personality changed radically after this accident. And that is what you really need to remember, that he had an altered personality after having a brain injury. You should also know the basic ways that you can visualize a brain with modern technology. This includes TMS or RTMS, which are pulses of electrical activity, which do produce a temporary brain lesion. However, this can be used to treat depression and has minor side effects. There's also something called an EEG, which again has to do with electricity. An EEG measures patterns of electrical activity within the brain by placing electrodes all over the scalp of an individual. And it can be used to detect things like epilepsy, examine sleep disorders, detect concussions and predict temperament in infants. There's also an MRI or a fMRI, which uses magnetic fields to visualize the brain. It measures how much water is in the different areas of the brain, which gives us a good visualization within the brain. The final part of the biological psychology component is looking at sensation and perception. The only thing my Psych 101 really covered within this is Gestalt principles, which is the tendency to organize information or stimuli into coherent groups. There are five that you need to know. The first, proximity. We like to organize things that are close together. The second is similarity. We organize things by similarity, by type, obviously. The third is continuity. We have a tendency to see objects as continuous rather than than as discrete. And fourth is closure. We have the tendency to fill in the gaps and to fill in the missing pieces to come up with a whole. Then we have connectedness, which is the tendency to perceive stimuli as single units rather than as components. Next, we have cognitive psychology, which was looking at learning and memory processes. There were three big types of learning taught within Psych 101. The first was operant conditioning. Operant conditioning was created by someone named B.F. Skinner. Remember that name. And it was learning through consequences of actions. Now, you need to know the terms positive reinforcement, which is essentially getting something good. We have negative reinforcement, which is essentially taking away something bad. And we have positive punishment, which is giving something bad. And we have negative punishment, which is taking away something good. And so what you really need to understand here is the positive or negative does not have anything to do with good versus bad. What it does have to do with is the addition or the removal of something. And then the punishment and reinforcement is what really has to do with the good versus bad. That's why positive punishment, which may seem a little strange, is actually just the addition of something bad. Next, we have classical conditioning, which was mainly done by Pavlov. Again, you need to remember that name. Here we are looking to pair a conditioned stimulus with an unconditioned response, leading to a conditioned response without needing that unconditioned stimulus. So let me break that down for you a little bit. 
The famous example is Pavlov and his dogs. When he brought his dogs food, they salivated. Now, what he wanted to do was pair that salivation, that response, and specifically that unconditioned response with something that doesn't usually make his dogs drool. So every time he brought food, he rung a bell. Now, that bell alone at the beginning did not cause the dogs to salivate because why would it? However, he did this enough times. He rang the bell, he gave the food, he rang the bell, he gave the food, that eventually just the sound of the bell made the dogs salivate. So, in this specific example, the unconditioned stimulus is the dog food. The unconditioned response is the salivation. The conditioned stimulus is the bell. The conditioned response is the salivation to the bell without the food. The third type of learning that's really important within the cognitive psychology unit of Psych 101 is behavioral learning, which was done by Bandura. Again, remember the name. And this is essentially just learning through observation. And the famous experiment here is the Bobo doll experiment in which children watched adults fight a Bobo doll very aggressively. And that adult was either punished or rewarded after fighting the doll. The child then got to enter the room and do whatever they wanted. What was interesting is that the children tended to fight the Bobo doll. They tended to copy the acts of violence that the adults did. However, they also added their own. Uh, they just knew that the purpose was to fight that Bobo doll. And this happened specifically when the adults were rewarded after fighting the Bobo doll. Thanks for watching part one of my breakdown of Psych 101 and stick around for part two.